there's one story that I hadn't been reading anywhere that, was, that didn't exist, and that was the story of literature itself. So in a certain way, I'm going to try to sketch that story. It, it's a long story. It's about 4,000 years along, and I'm, I also promise that I won't speak for a whole hour, so don't, no, no fear. So I will give you a, a very rough sketch of that. And it's at this point in the story about the origin of writing that the king of Uruk takes some clay, puts his words onto clay, gives the clay tablet to the messenger. The messenger takes it up into the mountain one more time and gives the king of Arata the clay message. The king of Arata, of course, does no writing. He holds the clay to his ear. No voice, no message emerges from it. And he's puzzled. And then in front of his entire court, he submits to Arata. But if you remember that writing really started not as religious practice, but as accounting, a very mundane message, or, or, or these kind of political messages like the ones sent from the king of Uruk to the king of Arata, the idea that suddenly writing itself as a technology can become associated with divinity seems perhaps more surprising than, than our familiar, familiarity with it may lead us to believe. I want to rush on to the next chapter um, that revolves around a very different scene. A scene that doesn't involve a king or a scribe, but that involves a teacher. A teacher who has gathered students around him and who follow his every words. And at this moment in history, they are all male. Teacher who not only, and teachers who not only introduce new ways of thinking, but also new ways of being. They demand that their followers abandon their old beliefs and follow them. What's interesting is that they, the, these teachers emerge within a few hundred years uh, from each other in the most literate societies of the time. In India, the name of this teacher is Buddha, and here surrounded by his students. In China, the na one name of such a teacher is Master Kong, whom we know as by the Latin name Confucius. In Greece, the name, one name of his teacher is Socrates, here depicted by David. Um, and in the Near East, his name is Jesus. What's interesting to me about this group, and there are others, is, as I said, that they develop in the most literate societies but that they have this other thing in common, namely that none of them wrote a single word. They could have, since they all operated in societies with writing, but they chose not to. And that's an interesting factor. It's sort of almost a, a kind of uh, Luddite moment in the history of writing, that there, there's significant opposition or fear associated with writing. Socrates is the one who famously developed these arguments against writing most successfully. They had to do with lack of control, that uh, piece of writing, you can't ask a follow-up question. There's all kinds of room for misunderstanding and misinformation, fake news. Um, he also feared that if we trusted writing, basically an external storage device, that our mental capacities would atrophy. So all kinds of fears that maybe in some ways resonate with our own fears about uh, 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 new technology. But anyway, so these teachers refuse to write. Um, they, their charisma depends on the kind of live interaction with their audience. And that's great, and that works really well for them, um, until the inevitable happens and these teachers die. And now the students are faced with a very interesting dilemma, namely whether to continue their teacher's insistence on oral storytelling or to use writing to write down their words, and sooner or later, writing wins.
Das heißt, ich weiß nicht, ob das hier in der Runde auch immer noch so ist, aber wenn wir, wenn wir ans Lesen denken, das Bild oder an die lesende Person, ähm, haben wir eigentlich immer noch so eine Vorstellung aus dem 19. Jahrhundert. Da hatten wir auch schon so ein Bild von der lesenden Person, die in ein Buch versunken ist. Ich musste sofort an Spitzweg denken. Sie wissen, die, äh, der Leser, der auf seinem Regal vor eben der Bücherwand steht, ich glaube noch eine Zipfelmütze auf, hat schon ein bisschen älter Brille und in dieses Buch total versunken ist, allein mit sich, der Welt des Buchs, im Stillen konzentriert, das Deep Reading. An diesem Bild ist in meinen Augen ganz viel falsch inzwischen. Zum einen, wenn wir an buchlesende Menschen denken, wissen wir eigentlich, dass diejenigen, die Bücher kaufen, inzwischen überwiegend Frauen sind. Das heißt, wir haben ja schon mal einen Genderwechsel drin. Auch wenn natürlich alle wahnsinnig viel lesen. Das passiert dann aber halt nicht mehr unbedingt im Buch. Das Lesen ist irgendwie sozialer geworden, auch wenn es vielleicht immer sozial war. Asozial weiß ich nicht. Ähm und ein ganz schönes Bild mit diesen, die Wichtigkeit der Bücher auf der einen Seite und dem Lesen und was dann tatsächlich passiert ist. Der zitierte Henning Lobeln hat in seinem Buch Engelberts Traum eine schöne Anekdote und zwar war in New York in der ähm, Public Library und schwärmt also davon, ähm, dass da so ein Tempel des Wissens im Endeffekt aufgebaut wurde. Bücher bis an die Decke überall und so weiter und auch ganz viele Menschen, die da drin sitzen und irgendwie lesen. Nur hat er dann auf den Fotos, die er gemacht hat, festgestellt, die gucken aber alle auf Bildschirme. Die sind also in dieser Bibliothek und keiner von denen hat ein Buch vor sich, sondern die gucken alle auf Bildschirme. Eine Langzeitstudie, die belegt, wenn man in einem Haushalt aufwächst, der mindestens, aufwächst, der mindestens 80 Bücher zu Hause hat. Und 80 ist interessanterweise die Schwelle, ich weiß nicht genau warum. Also wenn man 80 Bücher zu Hause hat, während man ähm, Jugendlicher ist, wird man später... Ähm, ein besseres ähm, Verständnis von Texten haben, ein besseres numerisches Verständnis haben und auch digital ähm, besser unterwegs sein. Also das heißt, es wird, diese 80 Bücher stehen natürlich vermutlich einfach für ein besonderes Bildungsniveau und so weiter, aber ich finde es an der Zahl festzumachen sehr, sehr interessant. So I know a lot of people say today that young people don't read anymore and that this is becoming a problem. It's not what we see on Wattpad at all. We're very optimistic about the future of reading. And I think many of these studies that have come out, a lot of it comes from the language that we're asking young people. Do you still read books? is the same as asking someone, how many pictures have you taken on a camera in the last year? Um, they're taking more pictures than ever, but they don't associate Uh, what they're doing is using a camera, they're using their phones, they're interacting every day. And I think the same is true of how people are reading online. Reading. Um, our user base tends to be split about 90% of our users are just reading and 10% of our users are creating, which is the same of almost any large scale social network you see, even sites like Instagram. Most users are just consuming activities or commenting on other people's while they're not producing themselves. I get what you're doing. It's not digital books, it's a digital campfire. And through that social storytelling, it allows people to see the responses in real time. Um, fans can comment on stories as they go, and it makes them feel more invested in the stories as well. Because it's a social network and they're interacting with these writers, it doesn't feel like it's this person removed that they have no access to. Readers on Wattpad feel like the writers are their friends. They feel like that this is someone that they know. And that also really comes into play later on for those projects that we choose to monetize and publish. But people write on Wattpad for a wide variety of reasons. Often it's self-expression. Sometimes it's just for fun. Sometimes they're writing things that they would never want anyone in their everyday life to know that they've written. Um, and some of them are writing more and more today when I meet with young writers and I ask them what their goals are. It's to be famous on the internet. 